Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about composition. Um, this is a PowerPoint, so I will, um, this will definitely be more of a lecture than what I normally do in this class. I'm going to try and keep it as brief as possible. So let's talk about some common structures, uh, some common compositions that you'll, you'll see. Okay, um, You can refer to them also as ligatures. So this is an S-curve. <clears throat> you will notice uh, the S-curve is used a lot in uh, landscape painting in particular. Um, one of the things to note, right, with a composition, we're trying to move the viewer's eye through the piece. What we don't want to do is trap them in the piece, number one, or uh, take their eye off of the piece, okay, too quickly. So when you see an S-curve, a lot of times what will happen is you enter through a larger area, get pulled through the piece, and then it's a little bit smaller at the end, okay. Um, now, by the way, I did these all very quickly in Photoshop just to show sort of the underlying structure. All right, this would be an L, um, again, with the black being the idea of what the composition is. So up and through, um, it can take any direction. Diagonals are extremely powerful um, structures in painting and drawing any two-dimensional art because they contain a lot of uh, dynamic action. And if we think about the idea of gravity, right, if you stuck a ball at the top of this diagonal, would flow right to the bottom, right? Uh, again, be careful with diagonals. They are very dynamic, but they can pull the eye off. So when you see these used, a lot of times they'll have something here on the edge, right, to catch the eye. Triangles can be used as either a framing device or to point at things, okay? Uh, radiating lines. Uh, if you have driven out in the countryside in the spring and seen a plowed field, you will see this, okay? Uh, in particular, in Western art, uh, one point perspective uh, uses a lot of radiating lines as well as two point. Okay? A circle can be used as either a framing device or to move the eye around the composition. Okay, This is a cruciform where you will have two objects that intersect okay? and the point of interest will be in between the two. Um, cruciforms can take place anywhere. Okay? Um, now the organization of the picture plane. Think about how you are placing your objects. Let me give you some examples. So I want you to look at, um, see if you can find some of the common structures, right? Um, and also see if you can uh, see how the picture plane is organized and what the intent is, right? Uh, I will include this PowerPoint also. So scaling the subject to the picture plane, this is Lucian Freud. Okay, he is the grandson of Sigmund Freud. He passed away, I think, 2013. I'm trying to remember. Should have notes here. Okay. Um, did a lot of very psychological work. I've seen a Lucian Freud exhibit before. He paints very physically. It's kind of hard. They're amazing paintings, but they're kind of hard to um, walk through. <laughs> um, because if you look at this, um, it shouldn't be comfortable, and it isn't comfortable. Part of the reason why is normally, as an artist, what you want to do is steer away from placing objects too close to the edges of your picture plane, because you make people very aware now and you, suddenly it feels very claustrophobic, okay? Now, Lucian Freud did this on purpose. Um, interesting guy. A lot of brilliant artists are terrible human beings, and he's no exception. Now, can you see some of the underlying structures that he's playing with? Where does he want you to look? All right, you notice the S-curve that pulls you up and through. There are also triangles that are formed, okay, and an L. All right. On the other hand, someone like Julie Roberts, who is a um, painter from Scotland originally, because she has some work in the Tate, um, plays with some of these ideas as well. Again, norm generally speaking, as an artist, you don't want to have your subjects hovering in the middle of, of a picture plane because it just looks lonely. Now, in this case, you'll notice there is a diagonal, right, that it's not perfectly the, um, the rug, and the dining room table are not perfectly parallel to the edges, okay? Um, number one. Number two, this is something that normally we would associate with happiness, right? Like having a, a nice family meal, and it looks like pretty fancy, right? So instead, because of her treatment of the picture plane, it becomes disquieting, um, kind of lonely, and kind of sad, to be honest. All right, Bruce Everett, um, Normally does a lot of uh, landscape, a very famous landscape painter. Okay, in this case, clearly 
the circle is being used. And you'll notice what he does, which is clever, which is he just breaks the plane with one piece. Okay, So if this was completely encircled, it might feel just a little too claustrophobic, and instead he gives us a little out. Okay. All right, so let me talk about the difference between compositions, closed and open. Closed means all of your elements are contained within the picture plane. So, for example, uh, this uh, flower painting, um, which looks like pastel, actually, from Henri Fantine Latour, okay? This is, hopefully you can see the triangle, right? And the radiating lines. And everything is contained within the picture plane. You'll notice, even the table here, do you see how it's not perfectly parallel to the edge of the picture plane? That is intentional. Um, even in something like as sedate as a still life painting, you don't want to make it too stable. Okay, uh, Giorgio Morandi uh, did some surrealist uh, style artwork. Okay, again, you'll notice nothing exactly parallel to the edge, right, of the picture plane here. In particular, when we're talking about horizontal lines, vertical lines are not quite as important, but horizontal lines, especially, I look at it kind of like the way, like, who do you want to go party with, right? Um, someone who is too stable is really not much fun. But you also don't want to go to party with a guy who wants to fight the cops, right, when he gets drunk. So that's kind of the way I look at, like, um, putting pictures together, right? An open composition, on the other hand, leaves the picture plane. Now, the important thing to note about open composition is that it needs to look intentional, right? What you don't want to have is, like, especially if you're drawing people, you don't want to cut off, for example, at joints, like the wrist or the elbow, because then it looks they look like they've been amputated, Okay. So in this case, Wayne Tebold, um, very famous painter, by the way. Um, and by the way, if you find any art in here uh, really interesting, like go Google it. There's a lot of really interesting stuff here. If you really like painting, he is a painter's painter. Okay. Now look at some of the. I'm not going to point out all um, of the ligatures or um, the structures, but I want you to look at these pieces and think what they are. Right. And for sure, diagonals, and there is an L, right? Um, some triangles, and of course, circles as well. And notice, like, how he has composed this picture so it's still balanced. All right. Uh, Claude Monet, again, an open composition. You see the diagonals, the radiating lines, and the triangle. Um, and once again, an open composition, he intends for everything to go out of the picture plane. Okay, the rule of thirds is a very basic rule for composition if you want to try and be effective. And that essentially states that um, human beings just like and feel better about things and find it more interesting when it's placed on the thirds. So where you have an intersection of the thirds is where we generally find interest. Okay. Um, just as an example, here's the Raft of Medusa. It is a famous painting by Theodore Gircol. Uh, romanticism was his movement. This painting, by the way, is the figures are life-size. It is a little over 23 feet long and a little over 16 feet high, to give you an idea how big it is. Okay, it took Theodore Giracold about a year um, to paint this. Uh, lots of really interesting stories behind it. Uh, he had a friend who worked at a morgue who let him borrow body parts. Um, I really don't want to get too much into the story here. It's really fascinating, but it's a good half hour long discussion. Uh, look it up if you think it's interesting. But you notice, like on the thirds, where does he place stuff? Okay, and do you see the pyramid, right, that he's established? And do you see where he's pulling you in, right? And you'll notice, by the way, here. I don't know if you can see it on your screen, but you should be able to see it on the PowerPoint. There's the rescue ship right there, off on the horizon. Okay. Gustav Klimt's The Kiss. This is also, I th it's like 5 foot 11 by 5 foot 11. It's a square. Um, by the way, the this overlap, of course, this is not actually the actual painting. You've probably seen this before, uh, where I've pointed out the thirds. Okay, You'll notice how he has framed them inside of this. Okay, A lot of people think this is romantic. I think they, I can't imagine them to be any more wrong. <laughs> to me, this is very um uncomfortable. All right, look how close he's putting them to the top of the image. And she does not look like somebody who really wants to be kissed. Okay. All right. 
Um, and again, Alexander White, just to show you on the thirds, you'll notice, again, do you see how this, these lines are not perfectly parallel, how they're very slightly okay, uh, diagonal? They're pulling you into the image, and do you see how through the flask he's pulling you up to the face, and you've got a nice triangle for the face, and do you notice, perchance, uh, what she's wearing here, how you basically have a big arrow pointing right to her face. Okay, and here's an L, uh, clearly framed. Um, I can't think of too many compositions I've ever seen that aren't obviously intentionally meant to frame more than this one. Okay, placement. So think about how your objects are placed on the page. For example, what are we supposed to look at here? All right, well, clearly, um, right, the mask here, because it's the highest level of contrast, is also framed by this pink hanger and then framed inside of this box. Okay, uh, here is a really interesting composition, I think. Um, the subject matter is not interesting, correct? Um, most people, and I don't want to say nobody because somebody somewhere probably finds this fascinating, most people are really not, really not interested in a spoon sitting on a tablecloth, okay? But look at the way he's handling the paint and how he's pu pulling your eye around the canvas, right? Do you see the diagonals? Do you see where he's pointing? Do you see how he balances this, right? Uh, I think it's a remarkable painting, to be completely honest, because he stripped away almost everything, and that's hard to do. There's nothing here to hide uh, the composition. All right, Andrew Wyeth. Uh, Andrew Wyeth, very famous painter. Um, this is Christina's World, is the name of the painting. And uh, Christina was one of his neighbors in Chadsford, Pennsylvania. Uh, so she was paralyzed from the waist down, which is, and she would drag herself across the field. This is, um, so if you think about the title, by the way, and Andrew Wyeth, like a lot of his paintings are real sad. Now, to be fair, his father um, and his sister died in a railroad accident. His father's a very famous illustrator, N.C. Wyeth. Um, when he was still pretty young, so in, he lived out in the middle of nowhere, in, which is good in some ways, bad in others. It certainly influenced the way he painted. All right. Regardless, do you see the S-curve pulling us into the painting, right? And if you think about the title of the painting, what is Christina's world? Well, if she's dragging herself across the ground, we are seeing pretty much Christina's world, right? This is all that, that she can get to. So again, kind of depressing. So the house is here. All right, then we can follow this diagonal down, okay? We get slowed by this building, we come down, right? And he pulls us back in and loops us around, okay? So again, he keeps moving us through the piece, right? And visually, what we want to do is follow this around, okay? But if we don't feel trapped, which is another important thing, okay? Eric Fischel, um, contemporary painter, paints a lot of... Uh, uh, issues with modern life. Uh, you'll see, if you look at his work, it's really interesting. Again, I wish I could talk about all of these, but there's just simply not enough time. And nobody wants to sit through like a five-hour video of me. Like, I don't even want to sit through a five-hour video of me doing this. All right. Do you notice the triangle pointing right at the face? Do you notice the L pointing right at the face? By the way, if you make a piece of work and a human being is in it and their face is visible, that will be your area of interest. Um, it's almost impossible to to not have that as the subject matter area of interest in a painting because as human beings, we like to look at other human beings. It's really hard to pull away from that. Okay, Caravaggio, uh, another one fascinating to, to sort of um, to read about. Um, he probably had some pretty severe lead poisoning. Uh, read, read about his life. Go learn something if you don't know about him. He's a um, fascinating character. Did some terrible things. This is Judith beheading Holofernes. And you'll notice again, right, where the light falls, how it's composed, how are we supposed to move our way through this painting? Okay, think about that and look at it. Look at what he's emphasizing and de-emphasizing, right? Okay, Edward Degas. Um, I believe this one is called the Belilly Family, Belilly Family, um, B-E-L-L-E-L-L-I, I believe. Okay, so uh, this is interesting. This is his aunt, and... Um, his aunt and his uh, uh, his uncle here um, did not, I mean, let's look at this painting first and tell me what kind of feeling you get. Does this look like a happy family, right? So here we have the daughter, one daughter looking at us, the other one and the mother looking off to the side. You notice none of them are looking at the father. You notice the father's not turned towards the viewer. OK, 
Okay, and you'll notice too that he's also separated, right, by some of these lines. Okay, and you'll see the L's, right, uh, the contrast. Um, this was not, we don't have all the information, but we do have a, a, a handwritten note um, from his aunt to him uh, after he had painted this and returned home and essentially said, I'm sure you're happy to be home and see faces not as sad as mine or as um, uh, argumentative and, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not nice. <laughs> My words today, okay, as, as your uncles, okay. So again, this is a really good way of looking at composition as a psychological factor, okay. Edward Hopper, radiating lines, I'm sure you see this. I love Edward Hopper's work, very much about isolation, okay. Again, Eric Fischel, look, again, what I want you to look at is how are they pulling us through the picture plane? How is it composed? Look at how many areas where there isn't anything, okay. That gives, usually gives your image some place to rest, okay. So don't be afraid of open space. All right, leading line. This is a really good example of it, just simply like, how are you pulling the viewer through your image? Alphonse Mucha, okay, famous uh, Czech painter, um, more famous for his illustrations. His, uh, I'll show you a painting here in a minute. His oil paintings are amazing, um, amazing draftsman. Look at how he's leading you through the piece. Okay, think about some of those structures. Peter Paul Rubens, okay, you will notice the pyramid, right? The pyramid happens a lot in, um, in art. Uh, especially in a lot of classic art, and especially if it's something that's supposed to be important, okay, because the pyramid is very stable and it's supposed to be saved for like grand things, okay. So here we have this battle, and you will see how he's leading us again. If you start to look, how is he leading you through the composition? How are we supposed to read this story? <clears throat> okay, Giovanni Battista Tiepolo, uh, amazing painter, really interesting for his time as well. Now, even without knowing the story of the crucifixion, and let's suppose you don't have any knowledge, right, of of, um, of the Bible or what happened to Christ, okay? Can you tell what's going to happen in this story because of the way he leads you through, right? You see how he's pulling you up and around and through to the top. You know that this, this individual is going to the top of the hill. They're going to be hung on the cross, okay? Uh, Thomas Hart Benton, famous American painter. Do you see the framing device here? Follow the lines. Do you see how he pulls you through the image? Okay, Paul Cadmus, again, um, doing some social real realism, time of troubles. Uh, this is an ugly, ugly painting. Painted beautifully, but it's an ugly, ugly thing that happened, okay? Look at how he's leading you through the victims, okay? All right, and this is one of Alphonse Mucha's paintings, okay? Um, he did a whole, uh, the Czech epic. Uh, it's really fascinating. I think it's worth viewing. Again, leading lines through. Okay, and that is it, folks.